Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 2nd, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our discussion centers on what we think will become the top three issues once the election results are finalized. First, the issues which will be involved in organizing House and Senate leadership and the interplay between those and the governor's FY22 budget due to be presented in mid-December. Second, the fiscal facts we believe this week's election winners need to focus on once their victory parties wind down. And third, from a federal perspective, why it's critical for the next Congress to prioritize bringing deficits and the national debt under control. And now, let's join Michael. We're diving into it now with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find them on Facebook or on the interwebs at ak4sb.com. On Facebook, just look up Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Or if you're watching the video simulcast this morning on Facebook Live, I've got links in the description to uh, Brad's uh, Facebook page. He comes on every week to talk about the weekly top three, which are the top three things that he believes we should be paying attention to and uh, taking a look at. Today, we're going to uh, take a look at, we're going we're gonna to forecast into the future. We're going to pretend like today's not even happening, and we're going to say what happens next. Organization and the governor's December budget, which will come first. Brad Keithley joins us to answer of that question. Good morning, my friend. Good morning, Michael. How are you doing today? You know, I'm okay. You're way too chipper for me. Slow down. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoa. All right. So, um, okay. Uh, the governor's budget or organization of the uh, organization of the legislature. What happens first, in your opinion? Well, I think we're we're not going to know. Uh, a lot on election night about about organization. I we we will know more uh, in a couple of weeks once the uh, uh, once the absentees and early voting uh, uh, are uh, are accounted for. I guess it's absentees, early voting are, are lumped in. Uh, once the absentees are accounted for, uh, but I don't think even then we're going to know uh, what the organization is going to look like. Um, James Brooks has a good article up in yesterday's. Uh, 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 Anchorage Daily News headline is election night victories won't guarantee control of Alaska's House and Senate for Republicans. Um, and I think that's right. I think it's going to take a while uh, to sort of sort through where people are going to land. We've got we've got divisions between binding caucus and not uh, in both uh, in both the House and the Senate. Uh, we've got divisions on fiscal plans going forward. We've got divisions on uh, PFDs. Uh, and while we've got certainly got candidates who are uh, on 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 both sides of the issue, we don't have enough candidates. I don't think on either side of the issue to 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 really uh, really decide this. I've, I've kept a running total uh, or a running analysis of where uh, the House races and the Senate races seem to be uh, as as we've gone through this. Right. And uh, and I don't I'm, I'm not even getting to a, a firm 16. Uh, to support uh, to support any vetoes that the that the governor has uh, right now, I, you with with certain with a, with victories in certain races, you can get to 16. But on the likely outcome right now, I'm not at I'm not at uh, I'm not even at 16. So I think I think this goes on. I think this 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 discussion about how they organize in both houses 
goes on until at least we see the governor's budget in December. Uh, and, 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 and then some start falling in line between, yes, I, so I will support the governor's budget, and others say, no, I can't support the governor's budget, uh, and start pushing uh, over into uh, another form of organization. I think we've got a ways to go. I'm hearing some rumors that apparently some of the more moderate members of the of the uh, Senate uh, may be reaching across the aisle to the Democrats, trying to form some kind of coalition, cutting the conservatives out again. I'm hearing there's some rumblings inside the House with Lance Pruitt, who is in favor of uh, a binding caucus versus those who not. I mean, there's still plenty of dividing lines that are drawn across the entire legislature. There are, and there aren't there aren't enough candidates. Uh, uh, on either side uh, to, to to really you know firm that up. If the if the if the Republicans and the conservatives have a sweep uh, on hardcore Republicans, hard conservative Republicans, and 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 conservative AIPs have a sweep uh, on uh, election night, that may that may uh, be enough to to firm it up on the conservative side. But I don't, I don't think that that we're going to see a sweep on either side. I mean, if the if the Democrats and moderates have a sweep on uh, election night, uh, that that will firm it up probably toward a, a bipartisan uh, caucus, maybe in both bodies. Uh, but I don't see that uh, uh, happening on election night. So I think we're I think we're in for a situation where we've got clear divisions on binding versus non-binding. Uh, hardcore fiscal issues versus more moderate fiscal issues. Um, and the, the next event, action forcing event, which is what my DC friends like to call, uh, you know, things that finally, you know, bring people around. The next action forcing event is, is the governor's budget right? Uh, and, the, and, and the governor's fiscal proposals. And then you sort of have people lining up, well, I'm going to be with the governor or I'm against the governor. Um, and 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 this sort of lack of of organization or lack of clarity, I think, may affect you know how the governor's budget comes out. He may be more moderate in his budget proposals if he doesn't have a clear, uh, if there's not a clear mandate in the legislature. So it's a, I I I I think we're in for a fairly long organization period, and I think we're in for a fairly uh, uh, long session uh, as uh, as these things sort of uh, sort themselves out. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. Fair warning, Brad, I may keep you over the top of the hour because I think we're going to run long on this. But uh, how much, how how big a, a component do you think this whole binding caucus issue is? I mean, for me, it's it's been an issue for years. I mean, I've been railing against it for years. Mike Shower led the charge on it uh, as far as one of the legislators who finally was willing to talk about it. And it has become a campaign issue. How big of a component do you think it was? Uh, leading up to this, and how big of a part do you think it'll play in what's going on today when people figure out what it really means and then vote based on that? Well, I, it's been it's clearly been an issue in some races, particularly in the Valley to a less degree uh, than on the Kenai, but it's clearly been an issue in some races. But here's here's how it plays into organization. There is a core in both bodies that are insisting that they won't join a caucus, uh, a, a caucus with with binding, uh, with binding rules, and that core in both bodies, even if the Republicans win, even if the Republicans have a majority, that core in both bodies is enough to prevent uh, uh, organ organization on on uh, binding caucus rules. I mean, so let's go to the let's go to the Senate, um, Senator Shower, Senator. Uh, uh, Hughes, Senator uh, Reinbold, uh, have, among others, have said that uh, they're not going to join a binding caucus. Well, e even if the Republicans win, even if the Republicans have um, uh, 12 seats, 13 seats, um, you've got people in that Republican majority uh, that, that have said they aren't going to join anything that doesn't have a binding caucus. I mean, Senator Bishop and Senator Stedman have both said that, as as reported in James' uh, recent article. So you've got, you've got this core that forms a core issue that that, that prevents organization uh, by the Republicans. So what does that do potentially? I mean, potentially that pushes if if the if the if the no binding caucus Republicans 
hold firm on that and they can't find a way around that, then you've got Bishop and Stedman at least, and likely Stevens and likely Von Imhoff at that point, who then are looking for a home uh, uh, and a, a home with uh, with those who are willing to join a binding caucus. And that, you know, then the Democrats uh, uh, become very, very appealing. So it's um, uh, on that issue. So so it's it's it, you've got that core division uh, in both the Senate and the House that I think uh, I think could prevent organization uh, unless there's a, unless there's some sort of overwhelming uh, uh, election result. The same thing is true with the same thing is true on fiscal issues. I mean, you've got you've got a core that says PFD, uh, full PFD, full statutory PFD, and and that you've got that core in um, uh, in in the on the Republican side. Uh, and even so, even if the Republicans win the House uh, and the Senate, you've got people who are saying, you know, I'm not going to join a caucus unless our fiscal position is full PFD. And then you've got uh, uh, you've got those who say, no, no, you know, we can't cut government here, we can't cut government there, um, and, and we're going to need to we're going to need to cut the PFD. And you've got a division on that. And again, there's enough there's enough on both sides. That if they that if they absolutely stick to that, you can't get you can't get organization. So, um, uh, uh, Bryce Edmund, Edgman is just sitting over there, you know, sort of rubbing his hands, you know, watching the Republicans sort of you know turn on themselves on those at least on those two issues, and um, and just you know saying you know, we've got a home for you on this side. Whenever you whenever you sort of figure it out, we've got. Right. A, We've got a home for you on this side. Right. Well, let's talk for a minute about the governor's budget then. I mean, the governor has to make a decision. And I mean, in my mind, as as we look at what's coming, as we look at what's coming, as we look at what the reality is, does the governor really have, I mean, you mentioned that he may be more moderate if he feels like he doesn't have the support. Is there really any choice? I mean, we've got a $2.4 billion hole. I mean, is there a choice in in other than coming forward with a um, a budget that cuts the state budgets down a significant amount, or at least proposes a significant amount of cuts. Well, um, two point four billion dollars is 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 a, is a lot of a lot of cuts. I think the governor. Um, I think this is where where the sort of the the, the tension lies. Um, the governor will make a significant amount of cuts. Um, he may even propose to upstream uh, the revenues, uh, the local property tax revenues that he proposed two years ago, about $440 million in, in oil property taxes that go to the North Slope Borough, to uh, Fairbanks, to Valdez, and to some to the Kenai. Uh, he may propose to upstream those. Um, and he may propose, you know, to 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 try to cut his to you know significant cuts to cut his way there, cut Medicare, cut, cut Medicaid rather, uh, cut Medicare, cut Med. Now I always get confused. Medicaid, cut- right? <laughs> Medicaid, right? All right, uh, cut Medicare, um, cut um, uh, or Medicaid rather, cut Medicaid, uh, cut the university, cut, and and th- but then he's going to have the explosion on the other side. Uh, of people who who don't want those cuts, so I don't I don't think he moves there. I don't think that budget moves there with the extreme cuts and with upstreaming the the local property taxes and all of the things that he did in 2019. I don't think he moves there uh, unless he thinks he's got support uh, in the in the legislature for going there. It le- unless he thinks he's at least got 16. Uh, that will uphold vetoes that 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 do those things by going there because the the pushback he's going to get by going there with that budget is uh, is going to be huge. It's going to reignite the the uh, the uh, uh, recall Dunleavy effort, uh, and the pushback he's going to get is, is huge. So I don't think he's going to go there unless he thinks he has legislative support, and you know, and, and it's not clear he's going to have legislative support yet. So it's it's a it's a it's a Fairly broad dynamic, uh, fairly broad parameters that I think uh, that I think we're operating in, a, a lot of which uh, depends on the outcome of of the elections, but but a lot of which then continues to depend on the type of organization people are able to come to uh, in the House and Senate. I found it interesting, Brad, that uh, 
you know, you, you've mentioned a lot of people who have come out and just, you know, just said that there's no way that they're going to uh, organize with a, uh, with a binding caucus. And again, you mentioned it, but I, I found it fascinating that there were a couple that said that they wouldn't organize without a binding caucus, including Bert Stedman and Click Bishop, uh, which I think just, again, shows the desperation, in my mind, the desperation that these folks feel to cling to whatever power that they may have had uh, in the beginning, because that's the continuing argument that we hear, that, well, if we don't have a binding caucus, nothing will ever get done yet. As Shower has pointed out, all of his research shows that most states um, uh, get the job done just fine without a binding caucus, as we have laid out for us here today. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, Bert is is used to being chairman of Senate Finance or playing a key role uh, in finance, and you know he wants the power that that a binding caucus uh, gives uh, a chair of Senate Finance. They they have. The rationale on that side is, look, if you don't have a binding caucus, you end up spending more because you have to go buy votes uh, for for the budget. If you, you you get a you get a certain size budget and then this this representative or that representative says, well, I'm not going to vote for it unless I get this in my district, unless I get a road in my district or I get some project in my district. And by the time you 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 account for all of those additional things that you have to do to buy votes. To get a majority, then you've you've ended up spending more. That's that's Bert's rationale. That's Bert's surface rationale for why uh, he thinks a binding caucus uh, is is important. But you're exactly right. I mean, it 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 centralizes power. A binding caucus centralizes power in in the two finance committees on on fiscal issues. It centralizes power in the two finance committees, and uh, and Bert certainly expects uh, to play a role. Uh, in uh, in finance, if not if not a, a chairman's role, at least a, a major role uh, in finance, and, and and likes to have that power centralized there. Yeah, no, and I think uh, many politicians like to be able to have that certainty, and I think that's what it comes down to. It boils down to certainty that we know that we're going to be in control of certain things, and that's what it. Uh, I think that's what it comes back to in the long run. But I think I think the you know Alaskans' eyes are open whether it happens this go around or the next go around. I think the Binding Caucus is going to become a uh, campaign issue moving forward, especially in the next uh, cycle with the Senate seats that are up. I think Mike Shower will make it a cornerstone. Do you? Yeah, it'll 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 be it certainly has been. It is in this election. I mean, Roger Holland is, has gotten involved uh, in that issue in in his race. Uh, it's an issue to some degree in the in the Wilson race. It's an issue to some degree in the Madden Stevens race. Down on the Kenai, it's a uh, it, it it's an issue in these races. I don't think it will. To be honest, I don't think it'll ever be an issue in in the Sitka race. I don't think Bert Sedman will ever have to have to defend why he supports a, a binding caucus. So it shows up in the in the more conservative areas uh, of the state and is an issue in the more conservative areas of the state. But that's not the state as a whole. Uh, and uh, and and you know you got Click Bishop who doesn't feel he has to. Uh, he he needs to run away from the binding caucus, and and you've got others who who feel that they uh, they're perfectly fine on uh, standing on insistence on binding caucus. So it, it'll be it'll it'll be an issue in some races, but I don't think it I don't think it ever becomes a statewide issue. Uh, you mentioned uh, we got less than two minutes here, but you mentioned the governor uh, reattempting to capture some of those oil and gas taxes from the North Slope and from the Fairbanks and Valdez and Kenai Peninsula on those uh, that that downstream of revenue from the uh, taxes. What do you think the possibility? I know it was ahead as a non-starter this last go around, but what do you think of the possibility of it actually being uh, viewed or heard this time around? I. I don't think it happens. I mean, we've got we've got a state that's got these lumps of votes um, uh, that are needed to pass things. Uh, you, you need to sort of amalgamate them to pass things in the Senate and the House. And the rural caucus, uh, Lyman and uh, Lyman and Donnie on the Senate side, uh, Neil and whoever wins the the Kotzebue, uh, race on the House side. Th those people are are necessary to 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 push forward legislation on a broad number of fronts. They resist to the end, uh, uh, upstreaming those the those uh, those dollars from the boroughs. So I just don't I don't 
I don't see that moving forward. I see the governor potentially proposing it, uh, but I don't see that gaining uh, traction in the legislature. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's one of those things, that's one of those issues that the legislature has to agree on uh, for the governor to be able to, uh, for the governor to be able to do. So um, I, I, potentially the governor proposing it as a bargaining chip, but I just don't see, I don't see the legislature uh, doing it because you can't, you can't put enough coalitions together to pass it. I'm going to give you the final uh, bite at the apple here, a couple, three minutes on uh, election day, your final thoughts, what your encouragement is to people, what we need to be thinking about. Just give us the, give us the full uh, three minute wrap up here. Well, people need to, people need to, to look at who they, they have the opportunity to vote for in their districts uh, from a, from a state standpoint and, and vote for, the more conservative candidates. We need to get to 16 to, to support Governor Dunleavy, to, to give Dun, Governor Dunleavy a basis to come in with a very conservative uh, uh, budget. Uh, and we need 16, we need to have 16 there uh, that does that. I mean, there are, there are races that that uh, that are gonna determine that. The, the, the Kevin McKinley, Adam Wool race up in, uh, up in Fairbanks, the Mike Cronk, Judy Henlicka race uh, uh, up in uh, up in the Denali area, uh, the Mel Gillis uh, 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 Calvin Shraggy race uh, in in Anchorage, uh, the Sarah Vance uh, Kelly Cooper race down uh, down in the Valley, or down in the Kenai, uh, the uh, the Gary Stevens uh, uh, Maddox uh, uh, Senate race. All of those races. Are going to are going to help determine whether the governor ends up with 16 uh, that that he can count on uh, for fiscal policy. He can count on to back up his vetoes. They're also going to help form a more conservative caucus or at least a more conservative core in both the in both the House and the Senate. So votes do matter. Remember that Bart LeBon won by one vote uh, last election cycle. Votes do matter. Uh, and and where you've got a choice between somebody who's much more likely to be part of the 16 than somebody that, who's not, get out there and vote for that person. And if you've already voted for them, encourage two or three or four or five of your friends who haven't voted yet right. to get out and vote for those candidates. Brad, you want to give us a quick tease on number two? Well, I think there are certain things that, that when they wake up in the morning, whenever that is, the victors... Uh, are going to have to confront about Alaska's fiscal situation. Uh, we've been through election cycles in the past, in 2014 and 2018, where they ran on one set of facts, and and once they got in office, they realized there was another set of facts. This is, I, I think we're, I think we're facing the same thing. So uh, I put together a slide deck that that says these are the facts that you're going to have to confront. Uh, the reality you're going to have to confront when you wake up. Thanks for continuing with us, Election Day. And that's a special edition of the weekly top three. Brad Keithley is giving us his uh, thoughts and analysis on uh, what's going to be happening uh, post-election, what we're going to be looking out for. We went into number one. We got a tease of number two, which was, uh, of, of course, uh, asking the question about uh, what should the winners know? And Brad has put together a slideshow to kind of go over some of this stuff which I'll be sharing on our Facebook simulcast this morning as we go through. Brad, uh, give, us a, give us a start here and tell us uh, you know, what, what the genesis of this was and uh, what, we, uh, what we're going to be looking at here uh, throughout this slideshow. What, what should these politicians be knowing? Well, the genesis of it is, is what happened in the 2014 and 2018 elections. In both of those elections, oil prices uh, uh, went on a slide – uh, about the middle of the year, and and by the by the time you got to the end of the year and into into the next year, uh, oil prices were down significantly. Both years were down significantly from where they'd been earlier in the year. Uh, but the but the races during those years, particularly the governor's race during those years, uh, was all was all predicated on talking about oil prices as they were at the middle of the year. Nobody really adjusted their campaign. Uh, and and their discussions during the campaign season to account for the fact that oil prices were sliding away, uh, and so you got you got the, you got election night and you got people winning. Um, you'll you, 
people on the listening may remember, you know, Dunleavy saying, well, I thought, you know, oil was going to be at $80 when I was, when I was campaigning. That's why I didn't talk about, uh, talk about certain things, uh, winning on election night. And then, you know, having to confront the reality the next day of, of what happened, of what had happened to, uh, to oil prices. So I, it, it's, it, th- this campaign has not been as bad in that regard. Uh, but this campaign has really, to some degree, yeah, in in the same fashion, run on some fictions. Excuse me, I got a cough. <coughs> run on some fictions uh, about uh, about what the state situation is, and and I I, I put together a slide deck uh, that that says to be opened on November fourth, to be opened after the election, because this is the reality that those who those who have been elected are going to have to deal with. Um, the 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 most important reality is that the 10-year outlook uh, for the state is is bleak, uh, not only driven by oil prices, uh, but driven by you know spending levels that we've gotten to, and and most importantly, perhaps driven by the fact that we've run through all the rainy days rainy day savings. So right, you y- you can say anybody can say I've got a fix for next year. So for example, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to upstream revenues from, from local government and I'm going to, you know, not do, I'm going to take the PCE funds and I'm going to use it to plug part of the dike. Anybody can say that, that I've got a FY 22 fix and, and look at me, you know, I've balanced the budget and, and, and we don't have to do, we don't have to do deep things uh, yet because I balanced the FY 22 budget. But the problem is, uh, the the real reality that these that legislators have to face is this isn't going to get better. In 2014, we told ourselves, yes, oil prices went down, but oil prices will come back up. Uh, and we have SB 21, and oil and oil production is going to come back up. So all we've got to do is spend savings for a couple of years or three years uh, to help plug the dike, and then the oil price cavalry or the oil production cavalry is going to come over the hill. And save us, and so we don't really have to have to confront that. In 2018, we sort of told ourselves the same thing. Well, oil prices, you know, have gone down for a while, but they're going to come back, uh, and uh, and 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 we'll be fine. And and oil production is going to be out there, and we'll be fine. So we just sort of have to get through this, spend a little bit more savings, and we just have to get through this. Well, the reality is neither of those cavalries ever came over the hill, and the reality now is we know they're never coming over the hill, uh, and and we also know that. That during the 20 teens, we spent out the savings, uh, the rainy day savings that we had, uh, waiting for those cavalries to ca- cavalries to come over the hill. So, it's the 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 the, the reality that that these legislators coming in this year are going to have to are going to have to face is savings are gone, the 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 revenues we're getting from oil. Uh, are not uh, strong. They're never going to be strong again, looking at the oil price projections uh, out there. Even if we get an uptick in production, uh, there's not enough revenue coming off that uptick in production to uh, to save us. And and we've got a long-term problem, uh, a long-term uh, uh, deficit that we're facing uh, uh, with without saving. So it's the, the time for saying we're just going to wait for some cat. We're just going to spend savings and wait for some cavalry to come over the hill uh, is gone. They're going to have to confront reality, long-term reality uh, as they, as they come in here. And that long-term reality is huge deficits, two plus billion dollar deficits every year for the rest of the decade. There's going to need to be lo- a long-term fix uh, in terms of either just huge cuts um, in spending, which, which will never go over, uh, or we're going to have to look for uh, alternative revenues. Um, and one other possibility is the PFD is going to be gone. It's just going to be, it's just going to be eliminated. So um, the 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 ten year outlook uh, uh, is bleak. That's one reality. Second reality is, uh, as I say, it's going to require a broad all of the above solution. All of the above meaning cuts. There's going to have to be deep cuts as part of this, um, and there's going to have to be some give on the PFD uh, in terms of PFD restructuring uh, at, at least. Uh, but there's also going to be a need for for additional revenues uh, from source. You're not going to cut your way uh, out of this situation. You're certainly not going to cut your way out of this situation and preserve the current statutory PFD um, over the 10-year period. You might be able to do that uh, if if we were just facing a one or two-year uh, problem until some cavalry came over the hill. But it's not coming over the hill. 
uh, and it's going to have to be uh, an all of the above uh, solution. The third thing is somebody's going to get taxed. Um, uh, it's either going to be current Alaskans. Some have proposed uh, uh, a glide path that using uh, the earnings reserve to as sort of another um, as sort of a savings account to help plug the dike while you're while you're gliding spending uh, spendings down spending or spending down. There's two things about that. One, we've talked about a glide path since the early 20 teens. It's never happened. Uh, we've always, you know, talked a good game in one year about we're going to make some cuts this year, but next year we're really going to get after it. The year after that, and the year after that. Well, we never got after it, and and I and the credibility of being on a glide path, I think, is uh, uh, is 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 remote uh, uh, to say the least. But the second thing is, even if you do pursue pursue a glide path, that doesn't mean somebody's not getting taxed. You're just taxing future generations uh, in terms of eating away. Uh, the 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 investment base uh, that's in the that's in the permanent fund, both the corpus and the uh, and the earnings reserve, uh, and that and eating away that investment base leaves you at the end of that glide path with a significantly lower uh, permanent fund balance than you otherwise would have had, uh, and that means lower earnings going forward uh, into the future. Another way of taxing future generations is this discussion about PCE about taking the billion dollars in PCE and using that to help plug the dike uh, this year. Well, that's just a tax on future generations because, because that billion dollars, as we talked about last program, generates earnings that are then used to pay for the PCE program on an, on an ongoing basis. If you use that billion dollars to plug the dike uh, this year, you don't have that, you don't have those earnings because you've used up the, the the investment base, you don't have those earnings, and so future generations are going to have to come up with the 60 to 70 million dollars to continue to pay the PCE program and the community assistance program uh, out of out of their pocket instead of having it already prepaid for off of that uh, off of that investment base. So the, 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 this generation really needs to confront the fact that it can't put this off anymore if it tries to put it off through eating away at the various investment bases that we've got out there. They're just, put, they're just putting a tax on future generations. Uh, and I think, I think that's the wrong thing to do, but it's, there's no free lunch. There's no free way out of this. Somebody's gonna get taxed, uh, either uh, the current generation paying for its own, own government, or if you try to plug the dike through, through monetizing these investment bases, uh, uh, future generations. And then the final thing, is the distributional effects are critical. This is this is what a lot of people try to try to overlook. They try to ignore that that different ways of raising revenues have different impacts on different on on different sectors of the Alaska populace and on different sectors of the overall uh, uh, Alaska Alaska economy. PFD cuts, for example, push the burden largely to middle and lower income Alaska families. The distributional effect is to push that burden to middle and lower income Alaska families. It also, ICER told us in 2016, uh, has the largest adverse impact uh, on the overall economy. Sales taxes, you know, some people say, well, if you've got to plug the dike with taxes, we're going to plug it through sales taxes. Sales taxes are similarly regressive. Um, uh, and, and people who say, oh, I can moderate that or I can eliminate that by doing exemptions, it doesn't do it. I mean, what what that does is push it to uh, middle uh, income Alaska families. So these are the these are the realities that people are going to need to confront. Legislators are going to need to confront uh, once they get through the election cycle. You you use the you use the number of one billion dollars in cuts. I mean, if you were king for a day here in forty five seconds, do you feel like that is a reasonable number? Yes, but I don't think I could pass it through the legislature. Yeah, I don't I don't think the Sarah Rasmussen's. Uh, and 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 the Josh Revax uh, would support a uh, billion dollars in cuts. So yes, I think it's I think it's perfectly logical. I just don't think it passes. Paul says I cannot support Revac anymore. Integrity is important, and he lost his. Uh, Brad, you just mentioned uh, Sarah Rasmussen and Josh Revac and a couple others. Uh, these are the folks that, in the end. They're the ones that blinked, right? I mean, they're the ones that looked at the oncoming train of the governor trying to cut this budget. And in the long run, they, you know, with a wink and a nod from the governor, they blinked on this. Am I am I wrong? 
No, you're exactly right, Michael. And that's and that's why there's a difference. I mean, that's why I say there's a difference between the Republican majority and the 16. Sarah Rasmussen, uh, last time around, uh, uh, when when the governor made the vetoes, uh, or when the governor came out with his budget and made the first round of vetoes, Sarah Rasmussen didn't support him in 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 the first round of vetoes. And in talking to her, her response was, "My district said we needed, you know, more money in uh, in these certain areas than what the than what the governor supported." I I can't argue with a representative saying, you know, this is what my area wants because that's who they're supposed to represent. But by the same token, they're not going to be there. Uh, when when the deep you have to factor in, they're not going to be there when the deep when the deep cuts are made. So if you're looking for somebody who's who's going to be there for the governor uh, uh, when when the deep cuts are going to be made, you're going to look for somebody who's going to be one of the 16 to back him up. You can't count you can't count on Sarah. Um, and and that's I think that's important to understand uh, 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 in in when you're evaluating who you support. I certainly uh, do it when I evaluate who I'm going to, you know, make campaign do- donations to. I want to find people who are going to back up the governor uh, when uh, when it, when when it push comes to shove and when he needs 16 to back up, uh, hopefully deep vetoes. So it's it, it, we, we've got we've got a, a wide variety of Republicans. We got a wide variety of of representatives in this state. There's some who are hardcore who there's their districts allow them to be hardcore. Uh, then there are some who are less hardcore who will vote on certain things on a, in a fiscal conservative manner, uh, but when it comes down to backing up the governor on deep veto cuts, won't be there. And then you've got people who uh, who, are, who are never going to be with the governor on on any of these issues. Uh, let's uh, let me go back here and take a look at this. Um, I think, whoops, I just lost the thing. Here it is. Um, the uh, Sean says the poor and middle class Alaskans are getting shafted if this tax business rolls through. They are majority of the state population, but I think the bottom line is is that they are already getting shafted. I mean, right? I mean, this tax business is not if it goes through; it's already going through with the taking of the PFD. All right, we've had taxes the last five years. We've just called them PFD cuts, but they're they're tax they're income taxes. I mean, they're taxes targeted taxes. On uh, on PFD income and and they have the largest adverse impact uh, on 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 middle and lower income Alaska families. You want to talk about somebody's getting shafted? The low the lowest twenty uh, percent is paying something like a twenty percent income tax uh, through as a result of the loss of the the degree of the of the PFD that's been uh, that's been cut uh, as taken from a from a statutory PFD. So yeah, we've been paying taxes. The 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 question, the issue, the distributional issue is finding a tax that treats everybody fairly. I don't, I don't mean to use this as an, as an opportunity to go down the flat tax rabbit hole again, but, but a flat tax would treat all income classes uh, the same. It would take the same percent from all income classes. Other forms, progressive income tax takes takes more from the, the top 40 percent basically. Uh, sales tax takes more from middle and lower income Alaska families. Sales tax with exemptions actually takes more from the middle income Alaska families. The top 20% and the and the lowest 20% sort of you know get a reduced burden as a result of that. But middle income families pay the most. Uh, PFD cuts taking it through PFD taxes uh, results in taking it from from the lowest and middle and the middle and lower income Alaska families the most. So it's we are getting somebody is gonna is gonna pay. Uh, and, it's, and and we ought to be looking for a tax approach, for a revenue approach that treats everybody fairly, as opposed to just looking for grabbing the nearest uh, approach that that shoves the burden off on somebody else. I mean, that's what Natasha has done with PFD cuts. Right. As a member of the top 20%, right. she's just found a way of shoving it off on somebody else. I got two and a half minutes here. And Paul says, can you explain if income taxes help the state or hurt it? And I think that there's a, some broader questions in there, but Brad, I'll let you take a crack at it here. Um, well, it's a, it's a trade-off between whether the government services that are paid for by taxes uh, help you view that as helping the state or hurting it. If you view it, if you view those government services as not being needed, uh, then then those then taxes hurt the state. If you view uh, uh, those government services as being important uh, to providing a, a quality of life uh, that that Alaskans need, then uh, then taxes actually hurt. Uh, taxes actually help 
uh, uh, the state's uh, the state situation. Income taxes, uh, uh, progressive income taxes, hurt a portion of the state more than they hurt others. They hurt the top 40 percent more than others. PFD cuts hurt. Uh, the, the the middle and lower income Alaska families more. We got through two of the top three. Uh, we left the best or the largest or the biggest for last. I don't know what it is. And that, of course, is the eight million pound gorilla in the room, the national debt, which nobody's really talking about, even with all the discussion on COVID relief and this and that and the government shutdown and potentials for this and that. The national debt is still a huge issue. And Brad, you want to talk a little bit about why it matters i mean what you know that there's a that there's no magic bullet here to fix this post election what are the important things to remember about the national debt and why is it still going to matter well a lot of people have ignored the national debt uh, over the last uh, 4 years uh, uh, president trump in the in the 2016 campaign said he was going to reduce and ultimately eliminate the national debt over 8 years in fact it's increased even before covid uh, it had increased uh, uh, on his watch. It has exploded uh, uh, with COVID, and now we are in excess. The national debt now exceeds uh, the gross national product. Our 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 debt is greater than our uh, than our than our income, uh, and it's continuing to climb. <clears throat> and it's continuing to climb. And even when you look at both the Trump and the Biden proposals, uh, uh, campaign proposals over the next. Uh, uh, 10 years, what they mean over the next 10 years. Both of them uh, push the debt up uh, even more. Uh, Trump push it, pushes it up through uh, additional uh, uh, revenue cuts, additional uh, tax cuts uh, uh, without offsetting spending reductions. Uh, Biden pushes it up through additional spending. He has some taxes uh, that, that, that offset some of the effect of that additional spending. Uh, but uh, but pushes it up through additional spending. Both of those uh, amazingly uh, uh, have roughly the same impact. They come at it a different way, but they have roughly the same impact uh, on uh, on on the national debt. They both push it to roughly 125 percent uh, of gross national product by the, the by the end of the 10-year period. If you if you if you take their their proposals uh, into account, um, and and so what what is that? We, we we seem to have forgotten the we worry about debt uh, as we go. Along. There's really two reasons uh, that that we need to be focused on it. One is we are pushing costs to future generations. We are essentially taxing future generations. One of the things that the that that our parents did uh, in the greatest generation did in the 1950s and the 1960s is they moderated. Uh, their demand for government, uh, they moderated the demand for spending, and they were willing to pay for the government they got, uh, and essentially uh, uh, gave us a relatively uh, low debt, uh, gave the, the boomers and, and, and those that follow a relatively low debt uh, environment. We, we've squandered that uh, over the last uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, uh, by you know asking for repeated tax well, last 30 years by asking for repeated tax cuts uh, without offsetting spending cuts and the result is the debt has exploded that comes back to haunt uh, future generations because they're going to have to pay uh, at least the interest on that debt even if they're able to roll it over they're going to have to pay uh, an, an increasing amount of interest on that debt and it is taking away their ability uh, because they're going to have to pay uh, a, a huge amount of interest on that debt, it's taking away their ability uh, to reset priorities in other ways. They're not going to have the capacity to take on additional debt uh, as this generation has done. They're not going to have the capacity to take on additional generate additional debt to to, to push uh, push their priorities. We've sort of we've sort of taken it all. Uh, in the last uh, in the last 30 to, to, to 40 years, and really not left a whole lot of debt capacity to future generations. So, one, we're, it is we we are we are creating taxes. It's just taxes that are going to fall on future generations, and I think that's that's hugely uh, unfair. And we're taking away their ability uh, to uh, future generations to reset uh, their priorities as they as they want to do. A lot of people right now are saying, well. Debt really doesn't matter because interest rates are so low. 
we've pushed interest rates down so low. Right. And so and so the interest costs aren't going to be aren't going to be that great. The problem is there's no guarantee. Uh, and if you look at if you look at the history of interest rates, there's certainly no expectation that interest rates are going to stay this low forever. Um, and and as they explode, as interest rates go back up from zero to one to two to three to four to five, interest costs are going to explode uh, along with them. And that is going to create the burden on future generations uh, that we talked about. So we, we, we are in the in this period where we're sort of justifying continually running up the national debt. Both sides are run are justifying running continually running up the national debt because of low interest costs. But that's. Uh, that 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 is not going to continue, and we're just pushing pushing a burden to future unfairly pushing a burden to future generations. Well, one of the things that you and I have talked about in the past is that you know there's certain things that's going to continue to put pressure on us. I mean, debt service of you know is going to become one of the largest line items in the budget here uh, in just a few years. I mean, we could be facing where debt service consumes more money than national defense than contributions to programs like Social Security and Medicaid, Medicare, I mean, all those things. I mean, there is a huge component. There is a cost to borrowing all this money, regardless of how low the interest rate is. Yeah, exactly right. And and it's uh, the, the bigger the bigger we let the debt become, the bigger that, the, 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 you know, the, the size of the debt relative to gross national product or, or, or you know, relative to whatever, whatever standard you want to use, the bigger we let the debt become. Uh, the more uh, uh, exposed we are uh, in terms of the amount that we're going to have to finance at higher interest costs when interest costs go back up. You know, some people say, well, you can get long-term money right now uh, uh, at, at, at less than 1%. So that's not a problem. We'll just borrow right now uh, and, and, you know, fix our interest costs and go forward uh, with long-term money. Well, the federal government doesn't do that. And there's a reason they don't do that, because they couldn't get 30-year the federal government's debt requirements are so big they couldn't get 30-year uh, borrowings at these low interest costs. So they're, the federal government largely borrows on these five to 10-year periods, uh, and when interest costs start moving, that has an immediate effect uh, on on the interest component uh, of, uh, of 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 the federal government spending. And as you say, you know, as the debt component goes up, if these interest costs, when these interest costs uh, start moving back up. That's going to mean interest costs are going to outstrip uh, Social Security. It's going to outstrip Medicare. It's going to outstrip defense spending. It's going to outstrip virtually every other segment of the of the budget and push put pressure uh, on on cutting uh, the remainder of the budget for future generations just to to pay off the the interest on the debt that uh, that their that their parents that previous generations ran up. Um, it, it's it's the same thing. Uh, frankly, Michael, that we were just talking about uh, in in Alaska by using the ERA to to set a glide path, is it's a tax on future generations. We're taking out of the hands of future generations uh, their ability to uh, uh, you know have have as good a life as we as we've given ourselves uh, based on using uh, uh, this national credit card, or in the case of Alaska, based on using up uh, our investment principal. Each generation needs to be responsible. Uh, for his own actions, needs to pay for itself uh, as it goes. Uh, and this generation uh, has just lost uh, its, uh, its, 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 its discipline uh, to do that. And this is really, regardless, as you said, regardless of who gets elected uh, today, it, I mean, they, they both, neither one of them have really been addressing this, uh, you know, this national debt issue. I mean, the president said he was going to reduce it. Instead, it has been increased. Biden has already talked about his new Green Deal and many other ways of expenses that he would, you know, add to it as well. I mean, some politician in the near future, before we reach a tipping point, is going to have to address the fact that we can't keep, we can't continue to borrow more than we take in. I mean, it's simple arithmetic. Yeah, I I was talking with some of my friends friends in D.C. and we were all, for those who remember, we were all going back to the Ross Perot days. Ross Perot was a was a third party candidate who ran in the 1992 election. Uh, had these had these great charts about fiscal policy, uh, and and really influenced the outcome of that election, uh, undercutting the Bush vote, uh, the George uh, the the W Bush vote, uh, or H W Bush Bush vote. 
the earlier Bush, uh, undercutting his vote, electing Bill Clinton. But really, Perot also had a, a big influence on setting the agenda for the 1990s, which was the last time we actually balanced the budget. We actually ran a surplus uh, toward the end of the 1990s as a result of the fiscal policies that got that got set during that period, uh, in 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 significant part because of Ross Perot. So, yeah, we you know we were talking about those glory days when we had somebody who came in and was and was honest with Americans about what's going on. Both the part both both the parties right now are running fictions. Uh, the Republican Party under Trump has run the fiction that the tax cuts will pay for themselves. That's never been true. It's not true. It wasn't true during Reagan. It wasn't true during Bush. It's not true now. Uh, and and the tax cuts haven't paid for themselves, and they result in deficits. And then the Democrats say, well, we're going to invest in all these good things. We're going to invest in infrastructure, and that's going to ramp up the economy in a way that those investments will ultimately uh, ultimately pay through them for themselves through increased economic activity uh, and through increased revenues coming from that increased economic activity, and that will pay for it. That's never been true either. What happens? When you when you when you push up spending, is you you might start with the with the approach that you're going to just spend it on good things, on infrastructure and other things that are going to push it up. But when the lobbyists see more money out there being spent, they go in and and they get you know pieces carved off for their special projects that that help special interests that help right. portions of the economy, but don't help uh, the overall economy. So neither of those fictions balance balance the budget. Back to the Ross Perot days, Perot said, look, we're spending too much. We're getting too much in. We're, we're not getting enough in, enough revenue in. We need to fix both. We need to push toward the middle. That set the agenda for the 1990s that led to a balanced budget. We need to go back to that. Brad, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thank you for uh, coming on board. We appreciate you being part of it. And uh, as always, it's great to hear from you. I guess we'll be doing an election rehash next tuesday hopefully by next tuesday we'll know something uh, at least a little bit and uh, we'll have some better idea where we stand thanks for coming looking, on board looking looking forward to it michael thank you for having me well that's a wrap on another week's edition of the weekly top three from alaskans for sustainable budgets thank you again for joining us remember that you can find past episodes on our youtube soundcloud and spotify pages and keep track of us during the week on facebook and twitter This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.